Sabio Holdings, symbol SBIO, on the TSX Venture is an ad tech company focusing on connected TV and mobile ad monetization. Sabio's platform reaches 110 million TV devices, and that comes out to 55 million validated TV and mobile households on platforms like Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, Samsung TV, Vizio, and LG, amongst others. So really anything that's like a smart TV is what they're trying to target. But looking at the share price over the past year, it's been pretty poor, to say the least. It's had a dramatic fall over the past year, falling 64% to only 27 cents a share, resulting in a market cap of only $13.3 million. So why has this happened? Looking at the financials, which are just, you know, in U.S. dollars, even though it is a Canadian company, you always need to account for that. Total revenue actually fell 2% to only $6.4 million from six point five in the prior year. Year. Notably, however, though, this is due to a fall in mobile ad revenue, falling by 50% to only $1.25 million from $2.5 million the prior year. At the same time, the connected TV and OTT streaming revenue increased by 29% to $4.9 million, offsetting the major majority of the deficit caused by the mobile. This is really due to the company's plan to focus on the connected TV segment. As the mobile segment requires higher customization, think about your phone and how many various different phones there are. It needs to be sized to that device, needs to operate on that device properly, where TVs are a lot more standardized. There's less models and they're more similar resolution. So it ends up costing less to focus on the connected TV marketplace. So it does make sense them doing that, but obviously it has hindered their growth. And as well, even though they're saying the cost will decrease at this time, we're not seeing that yet. The company's gross margin fell to 59% from 62%. Management attributes this to a shift in offering lower rates to secure larger and longer contracts, which should lower acquisitions over time. The result of this is overall gross profit fell by 6% to $3.8 million. However, like you know, I was saying, the costs are expected to be lower. The company has lowered its operational expenses by 18% to $5.4 million, which does bode well for operational leverage. When you have that lower fixed rate base, you don't need as much revenue to hit that profitability, to hit that break even, and then have that exponential growth after that. So it is something good to see is they did obviously cut back on their mobile revenue, but it actually did come back on the cost as well, which is good to see. Net loss. There is still, of course, a net loss, though. It did improve, though, to a loss of $2 million from a net loss of $2.8 million in the prior year. As well, adjusted EBITDA improved to a deficit of $1.3 million from $2.2 million. So overall improvements, but still the bottom line just isn't there. As well, the share count did increase to $50 million from $47 million, which for these companies is good to know because when micro cap environment, especially for equity markets, is just extremely hard to raise. And you'll see some of these companies, they double their share count year over year just to cover their expenses. So you do want to watch out for that for these smaller companies at this time. The company is, however, expecting a boost in 2024, specifically from political ad spending in the, for the U.S. election, with an expected double-digit revenue increase for the year and a year of positive adjusted EBITDA. So the financials are really looking to improve, but I would be slightly cautious just looking at it as the long-term run rate, rate as U.S. political ad spending will likely fall in the uh, uh, next year, and it, but then it would likely increase during the midterm election in 2026. So you can see that TikTok kind of variance every year due to the uh, U.S. political cycle. So you can't just say, oh, this year was great, next year is going to be the same or better. You have to really pull back a bit whenever there's a U.S. Uh, really election during that year and then adjust for the next year. Additionally, the company is benefiting from being a non-cookie-based platform, which cookie-based platforms, you know, those annoying little pop-ups you're getting that has been really increasing due to regulatory skepticism. It hasn't really appeared in the U.S. Some of the states have done it, but not on a federal level yet. But with your pop-ups, you're seeing that because the uh, U, uh, EU has really implemented those pop-ups to be forced, which is why you get them all the time now. And they don't leverage those cookies, so they are a beneficiary of that regulatory change. Ever switching to the balance sheet, the company holds 2.3 million in cash. They have 6.4 million in loans, 2.3 million in leases. So that ends up with a net debt and lease position of 6.4 million. As well, the company does have a weak current ratio of 0.65, primarily due to that large accounts payable on their balance sheet at this time. 
the company does expect to put cash generation towards strengthening its balance sheet in the next year as they are expecting this better 2024. But that is something you really want to watch with this company is the balance sheet is weak. It's in a precarious situation. If things do not go as planned, then that can obviously cause some problems. However, for Q1, we can see just the cash weakness is really reflected in the cash flows as well. Before the working cash flow from operations or FFO, as we like to call it, it was a deficit of 1.6 million, which is an improvement over the prior year's 2.4 million. Cash from operations, which includes the working capital, was an increase of 2.3 million due to the significant collection of accounts receivable of 4.9 million. However, that con- you can't have a constant decrease in accounts receivable. You only have so much of it. So it's not something you can really say, oh, they, they went up by this much because they decreased their accounts receivable. That's just not something you can do in any company. But just saying as well, that uh, higher accounts receivable than the drawdown is really seasonality. You have a uptick in Q4 ad spend, of course. And so they issue their invoices in Q4. They collect in Q1. You have that big increase in accounts receivable in that Q4. Then it comes down. That's expected. And that's why we want to look at something like FFO because it really more normalizes that wonky uh, working capital changes throughout the year. As well, though, you will probably see similar things even at exacerbated during the back end of this year due to the election on top of the uh, usual seasonal cycle. So in that Q4, you could likely see a very high uptick in revenue and then accounts receivable. And then the same thing in the following quarter in Q1 2025 of where accounts receivable gets drawn down. However, the only valuation metric we can really look into in this time is due to not being profitable. Price to sales is only 0.3 times. This does look cheap, but it's not that cheap because of the lack of profitability and overall growth over the past year with a weak balance sheet on top of that. So yeah, really, we have to just rely on price to sell. So it, it does look cheap, but there is a reason why it's cheap, which we were, were discussing before. So the bullish thesis for the company is Savio is able to successfully transition from his for, former mobile for, focus to the current OTT and CTV focus, and then have the ability to grow on top of that. They have the reduced cost and they can leverage that, operationally leverage the company going forward. 2024 is looking to be a stronger year, but that does not completely negate the current issues. The company does have a weak balance sheet that needs to be repaired as it's currently in a precarious situation. And if that outlook fails, uh, falls apart or anything for any reason, whether it's management's uh, issue or it's just something completely external, if there's a recession that reduces ad spend, something like that, they would have serious issues. So there's significant risk, even with a rosy outlook at this time, and they could quickly run into liquidity issues due to that lower current hit ratio if they weren't able to collect money or it weren't able to have additional sales. So before being a serious candidate, the company does need to fix its balance sheet. Further, the company needs to prove it can actually be profitable. Right now, the company is only guiding towards adjusted EBITDA profitability, which is a weaker metric than gap profitability or even non-gap profitability normally, and especially given the weak balance sheet. So overall, three things we need to see before considering the company to be investable. We need to see the expected growth, which they are forecasting. You want to see management can actually be trusted with their guidance because some of the management, especially in growth companies, they'll way overshoot, say they're going to double, triple revenue, and then they end up getting no growth at all. You see that relatively commonly with growth companies. So you want to see they can actually hit their mark with what they're guiding. And then further, we want to see profitability that leads to positive cash flow. And finally, that repaired balance sheet. So for now, we will monitor to see if the company is able to transition its business model and if that transition can ultimately lead to a financially appealing company. I think it's a good summary. Summary. That's decent revenue growth over the longer term, although down from its 2022 highs. Ad tech, uh, generally speaking, has just had a long-term problem of creating a strong or consistent profit or cash flow margin up and down different periods. And you couple this with a a weaker balance sheet. It just it, it just Sabio just doesn't make our criteria right now. Yeah, and like we ended up, I'm pretty sure it was in 2022 in Vegas. We ended up interviewing management. And in 2022, that was coming off of two years of positive adjusted EBITDA. And even in our our talk with management, like I've got in my notes here, and they're a little cryptic, so you know, take this with a grain of salt, please. But uh, you know, I just had written here, you know, positive EBITDA for the last two years. You know, asking about you know what they're looking for in EBITDA range, and I have written down here 16%. Um, again, that's not guidance. 
Um, but clearly, if that is something that they were looking to target um, in 2023 and 2024 or not there. 2023, yeah. yeah, not there. So, you know, again, we're interviewing many of these companies over the years and I'm always pulling them back up to see what they've said, um, you know, and just, uh, yeah, see how they're doing, I guess, as well. All right. Well, that's going to end it on Sabio for today. 